Hello, my name's Paul Mamoring, and welcome to my new series of masterclasses called You Are Sent. And if you hear that and wonder if it's for you, I want to confirm that it is absolutely for every one of you. What's happened for me in recent years is that I've begun to see my ministry focused in two main areas. And I have two passions. Number one, I want every believer to know that they are sent, that something happens in the core of their being, that when they get to Monday morning, whatever they do, wherever they are, they have this awareness, I'm a sent one. And I've just come across so many people, it, it feels like they're waiting for the moment in church that they go up the front and somebody lays hands on them and sends them. And I have good news for you. You don't have to wait for that. You're already sent. And you've been sent by somebody so significant that there is no better way of being sent. And that somebody, of course, is Jesus. So number one, I want every believer to know that they are sent. And then alongside of that is is for every church and every church leader to know how to send them. And, And that for me is what it's all about. I actually believe that we are sent twice sent once from heaven to earth. Remember, Ephesians says we're seated in heavenly places and therefore we are sent from heaven to earth. And then I would suggest sent again through the church to expand the influence of King Jesus, whoever we are, whatever we do, wherever we go. So welcome to You Are Sent. And my goal by the end of this is that you will have a greater awareness and a greater understanding of what it means to be sent, which another way of saying it, which if I'd put it at the front, might have meant that you didn't start watching it, but another way of saying it is you are apostolic. Now, the trouble is that loads of people hear that and they think, I called them an apostle. And it's just a sad misunderstanding for me. I know that Some people even go along to an apostolic gathering and they come away and think that because they were there, that means they're an apostle. So this is where I always start. And it is a little bit of an overlap of a previous masterclass, but don't be put off by that because it is going to drastically change as we go through. And uh, most of what I'm sharing is based out of a book that is about to be published called Scent. And it's about 40 plus chapters. Um... I would like to call it a field guide to every believer on being apostolic, but we'll see whether that is the subtitle. Um, So that's the goal, to understand that you are apostolic. So let's just have a a quick run through uh, the fivefold. Even that is such an interesting subject. I can't tell you how many times I've been on a trip, I've gone to, to a group of leaders, and we're sitting at lunch and somebody will say, what do you think about the fivefold? And everything inside of me wants to say that's one verse in the Bible. To my knowledge, the only verse that lists all five. And whilst I love it, whilst it's so important, I think we need to just put it in proportions as well. So what do I say? I usually say, please don't build a church with five offices. That's probably not a good plan. And it's a little bit like, um, you know, Bill here would say something along these lines, you know, um, it, it's, it's foolish to pay too much attention to angels, but it's equally foolish to ignore them. I think it's the same with the fivefold. It's foolish in my view to pay too much attention to that being a model for a structure of the church, but it's equally foolish to ignore it because it is such a, a valuable piece of our faith. So let's just have a quick run through for a moment. Uh, Ephesians 4 is very clear to me. It says that we've been given gifts of Christ to the church. That's very important as well. Gifts of Christ to the church, which is the fivefold, the, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher. But what are they for? They are for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. So immediately we have to make sure we've got the right definitions. Uh, and those definitions are obviously this. It's the equipping of the saints, which is all of us. We're all the saints. And for the work of ministry, and my phrase would be, we're all in ministry. The only issue is where you draw your paycheck. And so, so you have to unpack that to start with. So we've got that, and then we've got the apostle. What's the apostle's job? Well, let me press the pause button, and I'll come back at the end. 
I don't think that anybody would question that the prophet's job is to equip the saints to be prophetic. You, I mean, nobody's going to argue with that. That's, that's the job. The evangelist's job to equip the saints to be evangelistic. The teacher's job, which is a fun one for me, because the teacher's job is to equip the saints to be teacheric, which is my word. You can borrow it if you like. Um, but there isn't another, another word. Um, and, and so we, we see straight away that the, you know, there's a corresponding word that goes with each of the titles, the pastor and pastoral, the evangelist, evangelistic, the teacher and teacheric and the prophet and the prophetic. I think I got them all right in the right order there. So why do we struggle when it comes to the apostle? Because surely the apostle's job is to equip the saints to be apostolic. That, to me, that's, that's logical. It, and yes, we need apostles, but the goal, the role, the purpose of the apostle is to equip the saints to be apostolic, which is ultimately what Jesus did when he said what he said in John 20, 21, a passage that's become so dear to my heart because it's the resurrection Sunday night and Jesus, as one of the four things he said to the 10 disciples gathered was, as the Father sent me, so I send you. In other words, the apostle, Jesus, says, I'm an apostle and you are apostolic because I am sending you. So we, we have to get over that. If you can get over that step first, because you're not going to argue about being pastoral, prophetic, evangelistic, or teacheric, whatever you want to make that. The real word is pedagogical, which sounds like you're showing off if you even know what that word means or how to pronounce it. But you are apostolic. You are sent. That's what apostolic means. We are the sent ones. And as I say, sent once from heaven to earth, sent a second time through the church, out into the world to expand the influence of King Jesus wherever we go, whoever you are, whatever we do. That's the starting point. One of the, the things that I love about, actually about the apostolic, and I think we've been taught it so well um, in this house at Bethel, and that is change the way you think, which actually I think is probably one of the key principles for an apostle, is change the way you think. Um, in other words, we're sent from heaven to earth, change the way you think about earth. And of course, um, it's an old translation for us old guys, but you know, J.B. Phillips' translation of Romans 12, 1 was, do not let the world squeeze you into its mold, change the way you think. So it, I, I wanna get you to change the way you think about this. That's the first thing. Stop thinking of apostle and apostolic as only being for figures in the church who have a title, who are paid to go to church. The apostle is a gift of Christ to the church to equip you and I to be apostolic. That's the first most important thing. And the second thing in there that I would always add is the apostle's a gift to the church, which means I don't actually believe, wait for it, in marketplace apostles. I think we have apostolic marketplace leaders because if we, if we lose that, we may well call somebody an apostle because they're a Christian with a big business or a government position, but they actually don't embrace the behaviors and characteristics of the apostle. So I'm very careful about that. And I know that that might cause some conversation, but that's okay. That's what these masterclasses are about to, to stir up a little bit. So that's the starting place. Let me also though, just put some context into this. Ephesians 4 is one of the most amazing chapters in the Bible. And verse 11 is but one of the verses in an amazing chapter. So let's have a quick look at the context because I think this is important. Number one, the context of Ephesians 4 is starts off, the first three verses are about the unity of the Spirit. It's, it's about unity. So what a tragedy that some of the discussion about apostles has actually divided the church because the, the context is, is unity. And we'll, we'll see that a little bit later on when we look at um, culture because culture and the apostolic are really closely related. So that's that first bit. Then if you go verses four to six, um, you have the sort of the single focus of the body, the spirit of hope, of the Lord, of faith and baptism. There's this 
There's this singleness, this single focusness about it. And then, and only then, do we have the gifts of Christ, that, that he gave gifts to the church. And then verse 12, we've already touched on it, but this is vital. It's for the equipping of the saints, for the equipping of us to be equipped. Um, it, it's not to create offices with titles on doors. It, it isn't about that. And, and we also know, um, if we know our Bibles at all, that the apostle and the prophet are the foundation of the church. So it's, it's not about having a title and lording over people. It's about taking a foundation position and from that place, lifting up the whole body of Christ to be apostolic, prophetic, pastoral, etc., etc. So that's really vital. And then if we get that piece right, we see verse 13 says, it, the result is the unity of faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, and maturity of believers. Do you see why this amazing passage? I mean, it's, it's absolutely packed full of everything that we want. We want unity of faith. We want knowledge of the Son of God. We want mature believers. And what's the outcome? The outcome is what we need today, maybe more than any other time in history. The result is we're no longer tossed around, tricked, or deceived. And then it goes to verse 15, growing up to be like Jesus, the head. And then maybe my favorite verse in the chapter, but I love them all, is verse 16, which is the whole body working efficiently together and in the excellence of love, which is why we'll talk a little bit about excellence. So it's this incredible chapter that contains one verse that people ask questions about more than anything else. And I, I'm good with the questions, but the real goal is to change the way every one of you thinks. You are apostolic. Now, after watching it, and I always joke with this, but it's serious to me, um, it's a serious joke if there is such a thing. Don't go and tell your leader that Paul Manwaring said, I'm calling you an apostle. I'm not, you know, I, I'm saying you're apostolic and I'm not claiming to be an apostle myself, even though my name has a little ring to it. Apostle Paul seems like it's been around before. But the, what I want to be is apostolic. What I want every believer to be is to be apostolic. In other words, I want everyone to know I'm sent. I'm on an assignment. I don't have to wait for some moment when I achieve a position and somebody says, you're sent now, go and be a missionary, go and do that so we lay hands on you. No, we are sent. So that's that's the real goal. That's why, actually, I think it's kind of fun that when Jesus said it, it was a Sunday night, if I understand the days of the week, right? The first day of the week, which is the day after the Sabbath. However, that, that has changed changed into our world which means that the next day is a working day and uh, the next day is somehow Monday so I want everyone to go to church Sunday and get to work Monday and know that they are sent and then alongside of that is that every church and every church leader knows how to send knows how for people to finish their meeting on Sunday or whatever it is they participate and know, oh, we, we, got, we got sent. We got people behind us. We've got, we got people who believe in us, who are cheering us on. Mm -hmm. and, and personally for me, and, and I try not to sound critical, but you know, at one point in my life, um, and I spent 19 years working in prison, I was the deputy governor of the largest young offender institution in Europe. Not one person in my church ever really validated me for what I was doing at work. But I mean, I was kind of pastoring a prison of young offenders and dealing with difficult situations. So it comes from there. I hope I'm not operating out of pain. I hope I'm operating out of, I, I want everyone to know whatever they do, that that's what they're functioning out of. So that's really important to me. And then just to say briefly, um, this, this is what our world needs. It's what it, well, our world needs right now. And, and, you know, there's a few things that I'll explain, um, but we really do need this right now. Is this a new move of God? No, it's a continuation of the movement Jesus started. At whatever time it was, on the first Sunday night, first Resurrection Sunday, when the disciples are huddled together for fear of the Jews after a chaotic, terrible week that they'd been through of betrayal, of, you know, the 
terrible trial of Jesus, um, the crucifixion, you know, from one end of the week, Hosanna, the other end of the week, crucify. They're huddled in the room and Jesus walks in and says, as the Father sent me, so I send you. So for me, it's continuing the movement that Jesus started. It's not a new move of God. Um, it might be a, f- a fresh expression of it. It might be a stirring up of it. It might be a encouraging people to say yes to something. But it's not a new move of God. It's continuing what he began that Sunday night. And why does the world need it so much right now? What, why would that be? Let me just very briefly say this. One of uh, my uh, teachings that I, I've, I've hovered around for a number of years now is revival, reformation, and renaissance. And let me just quickly run through them. They all need the sent ones. They all need you and all you around this table to know your sent. Because otherwise, we're looking and going, oh, that's the church's responsibility. Mm-hmm. So number one, revival. What, I believe it's revival time. I go through a reasonable teaching about it that we live in the days of the greatest opportunity. Sheer numbers, just sheer numbers. There's now 8 billion people alive on the planet, of which 50% live in cities. I mean, it's, it's the colossal increase. They'll, in, in 15 years' time, there will be a billion under 15-year-olds. That's why when you hear the prophetic word, a billion soul youth harvest, for the first time in history is possible. It was never possible before. So we have this great opportunity, and it's an invitation for revival. And revival for me is when ones to millions of people come into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, his person, his power, his presence, and his principles. Another way of putting revival is when renewal goes viral, which I'm grateful to John Mark Comer and crew for that definition. Uh, So it's revival time, but revival is not going to happen in meetings in the church. It will be a part of it. It's not all going to happen in crusades. It will be a part of it in in, in large tent gatherings uh, in Africa and other places. It's going to be all of us fully engaged and taking our place. So it's revival time, which requires an army of sent ones. I also believe that revival must lead to reformation. If revival doesn't lead to reformation, we've missed something. And, you know, you can look at at some of the historic sort of revivals where you you read reports of thousands, millions of people going to meetings, even being saved, but the city that it happened in not being changed. And I think it's it's one of Chris Vallotton's phrases, you know, big churches don't change cities. That's really important. So reformation, now some may... Uh, not like Reformation. And as it happens, we're recording this on Reformation Day. You know, it's a, a, it actually is quite a beautiful day to be saying this. Some might not like Reformation because it references back to the Reformation. It references back to division in the church. I just prefer Reformation to transformation because Reformation feels much more going back to the original design and plan. What's Reformation? It's when the whole of society, regardless of their relationship with Jesus Christ, comes under the influence of the person, the power, the principles, and the presence of Jesus Christ. In other words, you know, the way that schools are run, the way that government runs, the way that business is carried out is, is all based on biblical principles and it affects the whole of society. So it's reformation time. That's not going to happen in the church. That, that is only going to happen when, when all of us know we're sent and we take our place in education or healthcare or government and we influence that arena, that sphere that we're a part of. And then finally, uh, of these three, just briefly, is, is Renaissance. And um, you know, I've studied just a little bit. I'm yet to go to Florence. I, I'll get there next year um, just to have a, a, a deeper look at it. But the tragedy, of course, of the first Renaissance, uh, which was you know, a couple of centuries long, was that although when you study it, you see music and art and it was signed you know, to God be the glory or something like that, You can even trace the season of the Renaissance depending on how Jesus is depicted on the cross, believe it or not. I mean, it's so so linked to Christianity that the tragedy that it ended with secular humanism cannot be overlooked. So for me, I want a new Renaissance. I, I want a Renaissance that gives glory to God, doesn't end with secular humanism. And I believe that those three go hand in hand. 
In fact, one of the challenges of our world today is that there are Renaissance men and women who don't know Jesus who are influencing the world. The earth is literally being filled with the knowledge of the glory of men and women who don't know God. You know what I'm talking about. And, and we have to change that. And the only way we'll change it is if you know your sin. If the artist, the movie director, the inventor, the person with the, the latest idea for a social media platform knows Jesus and is building that to give glory to God. So those three go hand in hand and they won't happen without you knowing your sin. It, it really it, it boils down to, to that simple truth. And of course, what we've had in the past, I think, would be we've had revival that's more linked to meetings in the church. We've kind of missed some of the opportunity of reformation and, and our renaissance, we, we've been afraid of sending people out into the world. It's kind of like, that's not a legitimate career for a Christian. I, you know, I think back and think when I was younger, if, if I'd said, you know, my goal in life is to be a Michelin star chef, it'd be like, oh, I don't think that's a legitimate thing for you to do, you know? And, and you know, I probably won't get a second go at that. But if I, you know, that's that kind of thinking. So uh, a renaissance is a new expression of creativeness and inventiveness that brings glory to God. So those three... So just to briefly sum up this first session, and, and I know they're itching with some questions around the table, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll jump to those in the second session and un unpack a couple of things. But the first thing is, I want everyone to know their sin, and I want every church leader to know how to send their people. And that the chapter four of Ephesians is so rich. Let's love and embrace verse 11. Let's pursue the raising up of apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, and teachers. Let's do that, but let's not miss the context. The context is unity. The, the context is, is the building up of the body of Christ. The context is the equipping of the saints. And all of that because for such a time as this, we live in the days of the greatest opportunity, revival. We live in the days of the greatest change, reformation, and we live in the days of the greatest access to creativity, renaissance. And you are sent. And when the body of Christ gets hold of knowing that we are sent, we'll see the revival we pray for, the reformation that we so desperately need, and the renaissance which will truly give glory to God. So thanks for watching this first episode, and we will be back very soon with the next one.